All right, that's enough pre-show. Let's get into the ask. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere. It's Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to go through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. It is the last Wednesday of the month, and that means it's time for another Tabletop Bellhop AMA, where we will be answering the questions from the fine folk in our chat room, the lobby, or in Discord, or anything that's come in over Twitter in the uh, preceding weeks. Yep. Now, thank you everyone who's taken the time to join us live tonight. Uh, these Q&A periods are always a blast, and the more people we get in the lobby, the better it gets. We try to do these uh, at least every other month. We're, we're not sure if we're going to keep doing them every month. Last month, we did skip. Um, this is the end of September, right? So summer's out. We're done with summer, and we have officially moved into fall. So what I thought would be interesting, and just to, just to give people like a a narrower focus than usual because usually we open this up and we're like and everyone just kind of goes oh i don't know what to say so i was wondering if anyone had any questions about transitions or or switching from one thing to another right now no again this is an ama feel free to ask absolutely anything as as you wish but it would be cool to stick to the topic plus it's just some inspiration to go on if it's just something to get the discussion going all right, well, we don't have anything in the chat room just yet. So to get things going, we have a question about transition additions in D&D. &D. All right. Christoph Vesna writes, I'd like to submit a question, if I may. In your opinion, would it be more beneficial for an RP group to keep rolling with D&D &D 5 Ed or to drop back to 3.5 or Pathfinder? We have a few players who love trying to make all these oddball character class combinations, and I think it may be easier in 3.5 or Pathfinder. However, I'm not sure if it would be worth it in the long run. Sorry. That shouldn't have been on. My bad. All right. Sorry. Uh, so we have someone who has a group that likes customization in their RPG games, specifically in D&D. And they are wondering about switching back to an earlier edition of D&D because D&D 5e doesn't have as much customization. Now, I will say D&D 5e does have a ton of customization. It's not like the options aren't there, but it, they did remove a lot of the, the min-maxing, the, the trying to combo your character class with the perfect stats, with the perfect feats, with the perfect skills, with the perfect prestige class, and the perfect magic items, and all those things, right? To try to get the most optimal build to do the thing your character does best better. And in 99.9% .9 of the cases, that was win combats, because that's what you do a lot in D&D. Now, this isn't a judgment on D&D or that style of play. It's a perfectly valid way to play that I have enjoyed greatly myself. I honestly think if you have a group that is all about that maximization that yes dropping back to one of the earlier editions of the game is is a very valid thing to do in particular 3.5 dnd or pathfinder and to me those games are almost identical i actually like the flavor of pathfinder more i love the whole pathfinder society element and the modules are amazing like that's what paizo got famous for was writing good dnd modules they they owned dragon magazine for years right and then when D, D went to fourth edition they went well we kind of like the way we were playing before and wrote pathfinder that's basically what it is right so pathfinder i almost recommend more than 3.5 for a slightly better focus i like the background better and if all you want to do is be really good at things their mission-based system the whole pathfinder society thing very much drives you to that point 3.5 still is valid personally i would recommend fourth but i obviously the fact that um Kristoff didn't bring it up. That's probably not an option for their group. But man, fourth, especially organized play, was very much about optimizing your characters to the fact that we had problems at local gaming events where people would get mad at other people for showing up with sub-optimized characters, which was a problem with organized play at that time. Because organized play at that time, you only got the reward if you passed the mission. And if you weren't there with an optimal build, you were ruining someone else's play experience and now they couldn't go to gen con to get the other shiny thing to bring home so there's all kinds of things there but yeah i, I don't there's no reason you need to be playing the current edition of D, D. 
Like, yes, it's the most popular right now. It's the most popular of all time, supposedly, according to Wizards of Coast and their numbers, which I fully believe them on, actually. Um, you got shows like Critical Role. You got tons of people. Like, just looking at my Twitter feed, the number of people talking D&D constantly is shocking. Like, a, a crazy amount of people talking D&D all the time. But there's no reason. The old books still work. Like, there's nothing that ruined it. And especially for 3.5 D&D and Pathfinder, with the OGL, there is so much content out there. You're not going to run out. There is a lifetime's worth of adventures and modules. And 90% of that, you got splat books. Like, even if your characters get bored of um, the, the core rule books, you've got all of the, the different books for more optimization. Now, another option, which I personally have not investigated at all, except to share some deals on it, is there's now a Pathfinder 2nd Edition. I don't know. I, I know nothing about it, except I know that Pathfinder kind of got too big, that there was just too much stuff out there, and there were too many options, and there was people were finding broken combos, and they kind of brought it all back in and brought it back down to one book again. And then, of course, now they're putting on flat books, and it's probably going to do the same thing. But I haven't played second edition pathfinder and i'm sorry to say i don't see anyone excited about second edition pathfinder now maybe it's just that not the people i follow but i don't see a lot of hype about that at all i haven't seen any opinions on if it's better or worse than the old edition all i know is it came out so that might be another valid one but don't feel you need to play fifth ed D&D because it's the latest edition that's a it's a silly thought process you don't have to play the latest edition of a game and right. I just went on forever and didn't let Sean talk it out. So, well, you know what? I mean, I, honestly, I I really have no nothing to say on this one. I haven't played D anD D since second or two point five. Yeah, uh, skills and powers. Uh, my actual, my, I actually had a question to sort of back off that. Um, in in fifth ed, do they have multi class or split class characters still? Like, is that still part of D anD D? I do not think so. I know feats are optional now. So the whole, when you level up, you get a feat that gives you a special ability that makes you different from everyone else. Those are now optional rules. I have no idea if there's multi-classing or um, the old, what were the two? Multi, there were two different things. So yeah, you were multi-classing or multi-classing. Mm -hmm. And split class. And split class. So Evil John in the chat, thank you, is saying you can multi-class. I'm not the one to ask about 5th edition. I've yeah. never read the book. True, D's I, actually played more 5th edition than you, I think. Yeah, I, I'm like, maybe and please maybe that's my bias why i'm saying don't bother playing fifth i haven't i've played fifth edition D, &D once at a con i own the player's handbook downstairs because i bought it when it came out because i was like oh new edition of D, D, and i own a sealed copy of the the starter set but it's still in shrink like i i just never i never went that way i we were we were at the time when it came out we were having fun playing warhammer third edition and then we were supposed to move on to star wars edge of the empire so right yeah, so I, I, I know enough. The only reason I know what I do know is I follow a lot of podcasts that talk about D&D &D Fifth, but multi-classing never came up, so. Right. Uh, and I, you know what? A quick, uh, at least, Twitter search for Pathfinder 2E shows a lot of people talking about it. So it's no. there. I think it's just not there in, in our in our groups. Yeah, it's just, it's not, a, it's not in our, I wouldn't say echo chamber. It's not like I tried to tune out the Pathfinder people, but yep. they're just, it's not what we normally talk about. So it makes sense that we wouldn't have that circle of friends. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right. Well, we got a great question from Brian in the chat room, a long time okay. friend of the show. Your topic of transitions made me think of something. I was rereading the Bellhops review of Fox in the Fort duet. I know he commented that Anshi Games doesn't usually like co-op games. Now, she's played a ton of games of all kinds over the years, but my wife hasn't. And I was thinking I might play Fox in the Forest duet with her. Is there anything that you find is helpful to tell people who are used to the mindset of competitive games to get them to enjoy co-op games? I'm tempted to have Deanna come over here and answer <laughs> this for that matter, which she's welcome to if she wants. I can slide over a bit. She won't hear this for a little bit, so we'll give her a couple seconds. Um, so I guess not. Um, she is welcome to, to answer that. Um, I'm trying to think what I would tell people for one point out that it's still about winning. It's still a game. Um, just because we're playing cooperative doesn't mean it's now an activity or it's just for fun. Cause usually what people like in a competition is they like to win. They like to beat something. The difference is that instead of trying to beat me, you're trying to beat the game and get that across that it's it's us versus them but the them is the mechanics or the system or the cards or the app in that case because many many 
cooperative games are now app based. Yep. Um, the other ones are um, I'm trying to think to make cooperative. So I think one of the first things you want to look at is how competitive that person is. So yeah. if if they're a table flipper in Monopoly, um, it might take a little more effort to bring them into that co-op thing because they're you know they're used to that that competitive nature mm -hmm. uh and the relationship between you and that other person is part of it as well um someone you're more antagonistic with um in in certain forms uh, not to say that you're necessarily antagonistic with your wife of course but uh you know if you depending on the relationship and, and how you work together um whether or not there's more complementing or integrating and, and how that relationship works can also play into how you're going to play a co-op game um, and, and, and how you might approach bringing people into that co-op game. Uh, if, if they are a heavily competitive player, you focus on that competitive nature, but you've got someone helping you compete, right? So you're both competing. Mm -hmm. You're still yes. competing. You are looking to beat. You're That's looking right. to win, but you've got someone helping you find the extra you know find that extra oomph to win um whereas if you know if if they are more i don't I don't know the best words to say it but more cooperative then you can focus on that playing together aspect mm. and look at the the cooperation and the the mm. working together and bettering each other through your own individual play right versus the you know competitive against something else Another way to think of it, too, is instead of thinking of it as a cooperative game, think of it as a team game. You are a team who is working together to, again, beat the thing, which is the game, beat the other side. But in this case, the other side is an AI or, or thing. But like trying to say, hey, we're a team. We're working together. Um, it's We're each going to be able to do our own thing. So that's another one, depending on who you're playing with and what they want. So if you're playing a cooperative game with someone who's new, who's new to games, you're going to, your selling point's going to be, you know what, we can play with open cards and I can help you play and you don't have to worry about knowing all the rules. We can work together to learn them together and you're playing up that I will support you. I will help you. Whereas if you're playing with someone who plays games and who's competitive, you can start saying, no, we will work together to beat this being another angle of it. And then another one is you want to, especially with a competitive player, point out that you're going to still be able to do your own thing. Despite the fact we're playing this together, we're still each going to make our own decisions. You're going to get to control your character. I'm going to control my character, whatever it is. Or you're going to get to do this part of the game. Like uh, we're going to be talking about a cooperative game later tonight where you could sit there and sit down and say, you're going to play this character. You're going to play this character. You're going to play this character. And that's what you might want to do with a competitive player. Whereas if you're playing with a newer player, you can say, no, you know what? We're all just going to play everyone. Everyone can make decisions and together we'll decide what to do as a group. Whereas I think with the competitive player, you want to kind of segregate, right? You're going to do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. The other thing you might want to look at is um, I'm trying to think of the silly term I've heard for this. Uh, I can't remember it, but it, it's, it's, it's semi co-op games. So games you can play together, but there's still a winner. So uh, who's going to play better, right? Who's going to do the most. So an example of that is CO2, which we're going to talk a bit about later tonight. The competitive mode on that has been changed to, a competitive co-op because if you don't work together you're going to lose whereas if you work together one of you is still going to do better another example of that are the marvel legendary games all of the upper deck legendary it doesn't have to be marvel actually all of the upper deck legendary games are actually competitive games like yes you're working together to defeat the villains but at the end of the game you're going to go through your deck and take out all the ones you defeated and add up the points and whoever has the most points wins so that might be another way to approach it now, that's not going to help with Fox in the Forest duet, for example, or say Codenames duet, but it is going to matter if you're just trying to I, I wean a person off the comp competitive games into co-op. That might be a good gateway, a way to, to yes, we're, we're doing this together, but one of us wins. And perhaps you could take that and add an element of that to a pure co-op. So if there's some way to change it so that, I'm trying to think of Fox in the Forest duet off the top of my head. You could grab the, whoever collected the gems could collect them, like put them in front of them. And then the winner of the two of you, even though you won the game, is throughout the game who collected the most gems. Or I'm trying to think of other, a pandemic. 
no, you can't collect the cubes you've cured because if you collect the cubes you've cured, you cured, there's a thing about running out of cubes. Maybe you can yeah. mark down how many things you've done, right? You could add a scoring system to it, and that might interest a competitive player more. Interesting. All right. Um, we got we have some great people in the chat room, but they're being quiet. <laughs> yes, they are. It's an AMA. Come on, people. Thank you for the question, Brian. All right. Well, we got a question from Jeff, who's not with us in the chat room, but he's with us here in spirit. Yeah. So what inspired you to make the move from blogging to podcasting? All right. So that Sean's got some history in that one. Sean, it, Sean pushed me. That was pretty much it. Um, goes back to breakout con. The first one we ever attended at dinner we had together. And Sean has been pushing me to try to podcast for many years now. And he kind of got us to the uh, got us to that point where we we had seriously started talking about it. So I don't know if you want to lead up to that, and then I can go on to the next thing that happened that made it more of a reality. Yeah, well, I mean, Mo had been had been had been blogging for for ages, so I think yeah. that's uh, you know that that goes the history of that goes back a very when did when did WGR start? Two thousand and two. Two thousand. So it's two thousand and two. The blog. And the, the online forums. Yeah, at the and, time and, it was a forum. It was yeah. a, a pro boards forum I launched in 2002. So we started with that. And, you know, around that same time, more or less, uh, podcasting started to break out in some some circles. Uh, you know, I, it wasn't really until the iPod made it huge that it became a really big thing. Uh, and the iPhone dri driving on from that. But it was, you know, it was there in the background. And I, I got involved listening to a lot of the early podcasts. Um, and it just seemed like a great way to get information across to people, uh, as well as just being, in you know, many cases, two people who knew each other having really good conversations about a topic. Uh, and that was my first concept, was mm -hmm. really the whole idea of me sitting down with Mo and me being the common man who's not the hobby board game guy, and having a chat with this person who knows more about hobby board gaming than I could ever know to chair and using that as a dialogue to inform the public about stuff. Uh, we didn't really have, it was really, wasn't any more concept than that. Basically I wanted to chat more with my buddy who lived four hours away <laughs> and it was a topic that we had the ability to, uh, to talk about, you know, it was, it was, it was something that we could inform other people about uh fast forward to you know 2018 breakout con uh i managed to get mo and d together at a table and discuss this with them and i don't think we'd ever really talked about it with d there before no um and her knowledge and her her blogging experience uh and her seo experience was something that she was able to sort of reframe into what we were talking about and understand and, and understand from a business point of view that it was technically possible to make that into something. Yeah. Yeah. Deanna really pushed it. She thought it would be a way to promote the blog. I had come up with the name. That was another big part of it. I don't even know when I came up with the name, if it was in the shower or whatever. And I wanted to do something with it. I wanted to rebrand the Windsor Gaming Resource. So what I used to blog, it's still there. If you go to windsorgamingresource.com, I think it's still there, wgr.com. It's their Windsor Gaming, windsorgaming.com it might be at. It's the blog's still up. I didn't take it down. It's still got all the old content on it, though I did notice a bunch of the uh, the images are dead because they were linking to things that are no longer there. And I used to use Photo Bucket for all my image storage and the Photo Bucket, as far as I know, was long gone. I know it switched to a paid model. Right. So that's kind of gone. So I was under Windsor Gaming and I wanted to separate myself from the Windsor Gaming crowd. Nothing against the Windsor Gaming crowd. But I wanted it to, to be more global because I'm like, Ed, who's going to go to the Windsor Gaming Resource for a review on a Paranoia game? Like, who cares about Windsor, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to separate that. I wanted the Windsor Gaming Resource to still be around, which it is on Facebook, and I'd still promote local events. But I wanted it separated from me talking about games and that. So I had come up with this idea of the tabletop bellhop where I and, and it was also inspired by the R RPG podcast Happy Jacks which is a Q and a show. Now, happy Jacks is, we didn't go, we deviated from what happy Jacks does. I kind of hope it went that way and it didn't. I don't know if it's a bad thing. They have very long Q and A's like, like people write in 
short stories almost about their gaming things that happened in, in the RPG sphere. And then a circle of hosts talk about those experiences and what went wrong, what went right, what the people could do better. You handled it well or not. And it would have been cool to kind of go there. Like if I would sit there, you know, last Thursday I was sitting at a goblin con and at goblin con, I overheard this conversation and it made me feel uncomfortable. So I did this and here's what the person did, and I, you know, like big long. And then Sean and I talk about it. That was more what I thought we'd get, which is fine. We didn't that's perfectly cool we did get some longer form things but i kind of had the idea for this for the the question for it and we talked about it with sean and at the time i was a huge fan of the misdirected mark podcast still am actually i shouldn't say i'm not anymore but the hosts of that show were there so after the conversation with sean and deanna i decided to pitch them and say hey would you be interested in this? And at the time they're like, oh, we don't have a board game show. And I'm like, but I want to be a board game show. I want to be a tabletop show. I want to do both. I'm like, well, we want a board game show because we already have a bunch of RPG shows. I'm like, well, I guess I could do board games, but I do want to be able to talk about RPGs because at the time I was playing both. So I don't know. It, 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 and at the time they were going through some restructuring. So different people were becoming in charge. And the person I thought was in charge was like, I can't tell you because I now have to ask my partner. And I never heard anything back like weeks went by and I'm like, all right, I guess I'll follow up at some point. And that's when, when, I don't know, the, the sword drop, the, 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 the guillotine dropped or whatever. And all of a sudden I had been working in the automotive industry for 22 years. I was suddenly told I was out of work. So that all of a sudden I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> Time for a life change. Um, I got to admit, I pretty much hated working in the auto industry. That's why I think I have as much gray hair as I do now. It was a stressful thing. I didn't come home happy very often. So we took that happening as an opportunity to try this out. So that was, that was the whole thing. So we were going to sit there and give this a shot. Where We're going to, I got a hold of Sean and said, all right, we're going to go. We're going to do it. <laughs> I never heard back from Mr. Acton Mark. So I'm like, well, sorry, Sean, do you know, have any idea how to run a podcast? Do you have any idea how to host it? Like I, I was kind of hoping we'd have an editor and, and the MMP people would be taking care of this part. And just you and I had talk, talk on mics, but Hey, can you, can you figure this out? And I think there was a lot of Google searching that happened. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've done production, but uh, this is a whole different level of production and uh, I'm still learning a lot of it as we go. And, uh, and, that was that was the jump we made. Uh, so Ryan has a question for us. Back into the gaming, what is an RPG system or setting you've actually played that you did not enjoy? All right. So to tie it in with transitioning, systems I moved away from because I was no longer enjoying it. We're going to try to stick to the theme. All right, so uh, Toon was probably the most disappointing RPG I ever played. I bought copies of it. Steve Jackson Games publishes this, and I don't know if there's anything wrong with the system. There are a lot of old Gronyards who tell me that it's great, and I just don't know any better, or I didn't understand it, which is possibly fair. But what I thought I was getting when I purchased Toon was an ability to play a role-playing game that felt like an episode of Animaniacs. I wanted to be able to have... Uh, Yakko, Wacko, and Dot, with Yakko being the higher level character who could literally basically do anything and rewrite reality around them and just like, the, like a high level tune. I always pictured him as that, whereas his younger brother, Wacko, wasn't as high level. Like he could do a couple th silly things with sounds, he had some voices, but he didn't do as much stuff. And then you had Dot, which was the female character who was kind of in between the two. And then there were all the other little shows, right? The, the All the other little shows that were part of it that i thought you'd be able to recreate and that is not it toon was much more looney tune slapstick short scene of just stuff exploding and falling from the sky and crushing people and just just too over the top gonzo i didn't feel like i was playing a cartoon i just thought we were improvising like i, I we could have sat together and written a cartoon together instead of playing a role-playing game it just did not work out for me at all now, I probably should have given Steve Jackson Games the benefit of the doubt and reread my book, but the fact it fell apart after only owning it for a month and it was in pieces, that it just ended up in the garbage because I didn't enjoy the game and physically it was badly produced and the glue let go and it fell apart. So two knocks against two every now and then. I don't play enough games nowadays. I think I should go, I don't know, find a, a PDF and read it and see if maybe I missed out on something. But that's just more the, the pressure of people who were fans of the show saying I should have enjoyed it more. Uh, for me, uh, 
I, I don't really have an RPG system that I haven't enjoyed, but I, uh, and I think I'd actually been away at school when you started your Burning Sun game. And then I came back and jumped back into to playing uh, in the summer, perhaps. Or for, for some reason, I wasn't involved in the, the very beginning of, the burning, of your Burning Sun campaign. Burning Sun. And uh, for some reason, that setting never, never worked for me. Um, I don't have anything named Burning Sun, so I'm trying to uh, wonder sorry, what you're uh, Desert D&D. Desert uh, Dark Sun. Dark, dark sun. sun, sorry. Okay. Yes, there we go. That's why I'm like, I don't... I'm like don't desert, burning, burning sun. sun but, but so. Dark sun. So yeah. No, no, totally fair. Um, I, and, and for some reason, that setting never wow. felt right to me. Uh, and I, and I, I don't really know why. Um, I, I suspect it's my own personal biases. And I mean, I want my, you know, swamps and forests for fantasy. <laughs> uh, I mean, may, may very well be it. Uh, and it's one of those things where the other one that I've, I've never had any interest in, and I've, I've listened to actual play podcasts about and still not enjoyed the spell jammer. And again, it's one of those, and it's, it's the same reason why I've always stayed away from shadow run. I, mm. it's, it's one of those genre mixing things that feels off to me. Like I want to play pirates or, you know, magic, but not necessarily both. And I want to play my elves or my cyberpunk, but not both. Mm. Um, keep your peanut butter out of my chocolate, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess. And, and, that's, and it's, I know it's my own biases. And because, I mean, man, Spelljammer's got some huge fans out there. I mm-hmm. even saw you you talking about uh, wishing you'd gotten into it recently. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm the opposite. Yeah, I yeah. used to be that way. I yeah. used to, I thought Spelljammer was the dumbest thing I'd ever seen. I saw the GIF, a giant hippo guy and these <laughs> stupid helmets people would put on. And then they did this thing where you could actually fly to the other D&D worlds where you could leave Toral space and fly to Kryn space and go to the Dragonlance world. And I just thought that was ridiculous. Now being much older, that sounds kind of awesome. I, I kind of want to start a game on one planet and like go to the Dragonlance. I want to put together a plot where you need like the, the, the MacGuffin from every planet. So you've got to like go get the spear that killed Kalak off Athlas, which is the Dark Sun world, and you got to get a dragon orb from you know uh, Takesis on Dark Sun, and then you got to go to I don't know any Forgotten Realms actual artifacts. I never read Forgotten. Realms. You get a Forgotten Realms artifact, and then you put them all together to kill the giant space dragon or something. I don't know. It sounds awesome to me now, and and like space rats and halflings swinging from the the rafters of a spaceship. I don't know. But at the time, I was with you 100. Same thing. Same reason I didn't dive into Shadowrun then, yeah. and I've now read the the two most recent beginner boxes is because now i'm like oh that could be really cool i'd totally give it a try other ones that didn't work for me um dark sun i thought was amazing i loved dark sun but know what that was what i liked about dark sun is what i liked about warhammer i like playing the underdogs i like the the trying to survive for the day who cares about the war just can we make it till tomorrow which is the same thing you have in early level warhammer as you get and it's the it even goes back to star wars right it's the the rebels with no chance against the grand imperium except in star wars they actually end up winning in the end where i kind of prefer the the grim dark warhammer where eventually chaos is going to win sorry and i like that aspect of dark sun it was D with that gritty do you have enough water that blade of grass over there might kill you and you know the the child over there is probably a psychic genius that can make your head explode and there's nothing you can do about it i, I enjoy that aspect of role playing or at least running games so I think that was a big part of what made me like Dark Sun. It wasn't yeah. the desert. Yeah, no. Wasn't... And, that, and that's fair. And I think part of the, my problem may have actually been that if, I want, if I'm going to get that underdog thing, I'd rather be playing we'll Warhammer. Play Warhammer. <laughs> yeah. Which I probably at the time would have rather played Warhammer, but we had people who wanted to play D&D because that's, that's the thing that has happened throughout all my life. We talk about the popularity of D&D. It's, D&D is very much the common denominator I found with role-playing groups. It's the one game where you get six different gamers who want six different things out of their game. You're probably never going to be able to pick a system, but all six of those players would probably say, sure, I'll play D&D because right. they know it. At, at least that's what, I, in my experience, that's what's happened. Now, what are the, the question is other ones, I lost it because I scrolled down. There was RPGs we moved away from, settings we actually played that did not enjoy. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I We did play one game of GURPS. I wasn't a fan. I did not enjoy Amber the one time we were going to play it. Now, all we did was we went through the character generation system, but then like there was all this homework to do and like... 
that's that's a lifestyle game like it, it takes a level of investment that the dm really wanted everyone to get into and most of the players were kind of like oh, i'm gonna go home and draw tarot cards or write out novels or like come on i just want to show up and play so amber was one that did not work out i did think it was fascinating that it was a system that was written that was um diceless and that had some neat ideas but that was one i did not enjoy i, I think amber is one we would probably be more likely to drift you now where we have that yeah. the more mod, the more modern rpg um mindset and, are, and are, are more open to, to a lot of those different storytelling games as opposed to the dice mm -hmm. chuckers that that was the thing it's the other thing too with amber is i think nowadays with the internet it'd be so much easier you'd have like a wiki where you could go <laughs> add your stuff and things like that i think that would be interesting um i i know there's others i'm trying to think of a couple others can do that do we have anything else oh we have something here yeah. i was about to move on <laughs> and evil john jumps in so what's the view in a transition to digital from in-person rpgs that's something we haven't especially really delved into much no. but uh you know it, it's it's happening a lot right now um whereas a lot of people are being forced into this new transition now, luckily, I think personally, one of the greatest aspects of this is that we're all being forced to move digitally together, uh, whether it's an RPG, whether it's your work or anything else. So, you know, everyone now knows how to run a Zoom conference or a video conference of your choice. Uh, so there's a lot more comfortability of sitting around and staring at a screen full of your friends or family or, you know, coworkers or whatever. And so that 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 force you know that um momentum has helped all of us uh become a little more engaged and then with that we've had this explosion of new options to focus on the role playing part as well as the communication part which has already sort of been handled so i mean roll 20 has been around for ages um and there are mm -hmm. it has its ups and downs uh discord has really been sort of growing by leaps and bounds uh, in the role-playing community over the last couple of years. And then uh, we've now got other thing, other options showing up. We talked about one last week, uh, the, the Nomat... Um, the Owlbear? The Owlbear, yeah. Uh, the Owlbear at Gnome or whatever it was called. It was something strange. Um, yeah, I forget offhand. That was a good one, too. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we've got, you know, the board game... Uh, Owlbear Arena. Rodeo. Owlbear.rodeo. There we go. Just, you know, a really quick and simple way to get things up and running when you've already got Zoom or whatever uh, running for your competition. Uh, there are other ones like Foundry ta a Virtual Tabletop where you can buy your own and run your own server in your own mm -hmm. for a bunch of different games. Uh, or Kickstarters had had some new ones. I'm I'm waiting on hearing, and I should be anytime today or tomorrow, I think, getting mm -hmm. my, uh, my, my login for Roll. Uh, R-O-L-E, which is one of the new ones coming up, which is a lot more focused on sort of a whiteboard and communication with a little bit of dice and not as heavy on the dungeons as something like mm -hmm. Roll20 is. Uh, so the, again, because we're all forced to move online, that has helped the role players who tend to be a little on the more technical, technically, technically savvy side or adaptable side to move with relative ease there. So view on transition to digital, I personally still prefer playing in person. I think I always will. I know a lot of people, though, who actually now prefer playing online that have gotten so used to it. The fact they can do it in the comfort of their own home. They don't have to go out. They don't have to meet with people. They don't have to worry about who's bringing the drinks or any of the, the social graces of it. They don't have to worry about what they're wearing, whatever it is, whatever the case may be. They actually prefer playing online. The other thing is online has opened it up for people who don't have local groups, which I think is amazing. And that even pre pandemic, post pandemic has been an awesome thing. Like there are so many people. And then added to that is it has added a level of safety that was missing before. Before you used to be stuck with who was local. And a lot of us put up with a lot of crap. We probably should have never put up with just to be able to game. The, the gaming was worth enough to us that we would take risks and potentially hurt ourselves and others just to be able to play. Like, and I don't mean playing with sharp knives. I think people understand what I'm saying is, is there were, are some people you don't want to game with. And 
it used to be you were stuck. You're like, I either I play in this D&D campaign where the DM's a jerk and he's going to kill my family and he's going to make things happen to my character I don't want to happen, but it's better than not playing at all. By being able to play online, you can leave those people behind. And if they're having their fun doing their thing, they can still stay in their basement doing their thing together or that player is eventually going to be left with no one to play with. And then when they get online, online, it's really simple to close a chat room or to block someone or to mute a channel or any of that, which is, I, I think, a really good thing. It's it's something that people could not deal with in the past. And, like, I've met so many people that have been damaged from prior role-playing game groups. Like, players at public play events who come in, and I can just tell. Like, they're, they're, there's a certain I, a mannerism that players have that I'm like, wow, where the, the you played with DMs who did bad things. And that's sad and it sucks. And it's awesome that you don't necessarily have to. Everyone does not, not everyone has to go through that. Anymore. Now, of course, there are still people who don't have the internet and everything. So that is one of the small problems with this is it is adding a level of classism to role playing that if you don't have the technology, you can't play online, which thankfully nowadays isn't a problem for most people. Like the technology is much more readily available, but there are still people out there who can't do a Zoom meeting, who don't have the technology, who don't have the smart devices to be able to play online. And I don't like that that is creating the divide. And I don't know if that'll ever be fixed. Yeah, unfortunately, I think one of the biggest uh, problems with the transition is the people who are already role-playing can transition. But we are losing, during this time of pandemic, mm -hmm. the ability to get people into the system right you don't have yeah. that group of teenage friends coming home after school and opening up the red box or or whatever to sit around and explore this awesome thing that is role-playing because yeah. they can't um and more than likely they're going to sit down on uh you know facetime and watch a youtube video together or something um because they they aren't they're there isn't that same interaction when you're sitting there with mm -hmm. those rule books and those character sheets right in front of you. Um, and it's, it would take, uh, you know, strong parenting from a number of different parents. You know, you, you almost need a group of role-playing parents to, <laughs> to bring their kids together and hope they all get together and, you know, hope they all get along in the right uh, dynamics in order to, to pass that on. Though on the other side, what they might find on YouTube is many people sitting around playing D&D, &D, which could get them interested in role-playing, which is something we didn't have. You can now consume role-playing as entertainment, as, as passively, right? You can watch You can as a sport. You can watch Critical Role. You can watch, oh my God, Like I, I think our list has 350 different actual play YouTube channels on it, and I'm sure I don't have all of them. So there is that now that aspect of people discovering games that way. And I think in a way that has replaced the, I was at Kohl's and bought this weird looking red box and then went home and went, Oh my God, showed my friends. Now it's the, Oh my God, I discovered this thing called critical role. They're playing this game called D and D. And I think that's kind of replaced it I, again. I don't know if that's good or bad. It's just a change. It's just a shift. Yeah. Cause I, the other I... thing is role playing nowadays has been around long enough that it's a verbal tradition. I don't think there's I, like, People are shocked when I tell them, they're like, oh, who'd you learn to role play from? I'm like, I took the box off the shelf and I read it and figured it out. And people are like, whoa, no one does that now, right? Like you're always introduced to it from someone. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I, I struggle a little bit because I, for me, uh, and I, this is heresy because this is something we do. I don't enjoy role playing actual plays. Um, yeah. and, 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 and there's a couple of different problems, I think. I mean, one you get there, there's there's two kinds right there's the there's the critical role which are mm -hmm. you know the next level there's the, they are a production and they are a problem in that they're something that most people look at as entertainment it's a movie yep. it's not something they're going to do at home mm -hmm. it's unapproachable uh whereas you know you get your normal average actual play which is five people sitting around in little windows talking Mm -hmm. that it struggles to be interesting. You need to have the right mix of people and the right content to connect with your viewer. And, you know, if I don't know any of those people and, and the content doesn't mean anything to me, it's, it's a struggle for me to connect with that. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I sit down and I'm bored, I can turn on my, a Minecraft Let's Play video or a Fortnite Let's Play video and immediately know what's going on. And while it may not be riveting, 
it's immediately connective content for a lot of people, especially the youth. So I don't know, based on the popularity I see of every almost almost every actual play, I think that just you're not in the norm here. I don't know if it's an age thing or what. I personally I don't like them much myself. I I first found them through podcasts, actual play podcasts, and I found there were very few I could listen through to the end. There were a couple I listened to more as uh, instructionals. That's how I learned to run Marvel Heroic Role Playing because the rule book is terrible at getting the concepts across. Whereas listening to an actual play and I'm like, oh, okay, that's how that works. And then when I was able to play, it worked great. But like, I personally, I can't stand the overproduced ones, like the entertainment ones. Because to me, I watch them and it, I don't mean, no, it's not role playing, but it's not what I'm used to seeing at the table. And it doesn't give me the feeling of being at that table and enjoying the experience. I don't, I don't, I don't get a nostalgia of, oh, I've been there with my group and I remember that happening, which is what I tend to get from the non-professional ones is I, as I sit there. And the other problem I have is I'm a DM and I DM for 40 years or so, not quite. 30 at least 30 years 35 years or whatever and i i'm doing the terrier harrow because i hear the mistakes and it drives me nuts right. <laughs> and i'm like no don't why 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 you just you put them in a corner all you had to do was say yes right often i'm saying all you had to do was say yes because the players come up with these awesome things and the dms just shut them down and i'm like no come on they're, they're giving they're raking the rain they're doing the dance in front of you come on give it to them and what? and that's where i find actual plays hard to listen and watch to is i can't help but judge them and think well this is what i'd do in that situation see the one actual play that i actually became involved with and oddly enough it was it was very spell jammer ish um and and yet i still was nerd poker um, that was my introduction to uh, Nerd Poker. And it was because um, uh, Brian Pesain, who's a comedian who I've always enjoyed, was you know one of the major people behind it and, and, and sort of pushing that. And it felt, the reason I got into it was it felt a lot like our group, right? Mm. That we, it, was, he, it wasn't over-the-top comedy. They weren't putting on voices. It was a bunch of guys who have been sitting down at a table. It happened to be in LA, but sitting down at a table for years playing mm. who decided to put a mic down on the table and play and you got these stories of you know because they were they were entertainers to the, for the most part where they would you know stop at one point and tell the story of why this was funny so you got the background of oh, that's cool. oh you know i just threw this guy's head into a bag and everyone laughed oh well because three years ago Elrond the great blah 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 and and you got these stories and it, you felt like you were part of the table and it felt like a table we had been part of. Um, and, and again, th those guys are all about around our age too. And that was, mm -hmm. I'm sure, part of it. Um, and I don't know if there are the same sort of connections out there. There, there weren't for women, that's for sure. Well, uh, sure. And, and whether or not people of color or, or others had that po sort of podcast out there. That was the one mm -hmm. I knew and I connected with. Um, that's but, another advantage of going online too, is the anonymity. Uh, especially if you're playing with uh, just text, but even with voices, you can easily match your voices and it's allowed some pe marginalized people be able to take it advantage of and be able to play that might not be before. Right. So uh, Ryan in our chat room, who is a blind meeple, pointed out the move to online play means that us blind board gamer enthusiasts are generally left behind. There's some options for RPGs, but pretty much nothing for other forms of accessible hobby, tabletop hobby game, hobby, whatever, tabletop games. Um, I'm surprised there isn't more like, like board game arena. Like there are so many ways to play board games online that no one has developed a way to play them with um, screen readers, like in, in some actually effective way. Yeah. I like, it just seems like that's a missing opportunity that that would be out there. Well, and I think a lot of it is that I don't know if um, people have made the demand necessary. Cause I mean, realistically what you need to do is go into board game arena and put in alt text for, for every everything. object in the game. Um, and it's a lot of work. And if the demand's not there, if, if you know... The it's... problem with that is even with that, how do you mo manipulate the pieces? Right. Right? That you also need some kind of like voice recognition, like, you know, move, move the pawn from B6 to C3, right? Like yeah, you yeah. need some type of interface on both sides like it's not just being able to see what's on the screen but it's also being able to manipulate it and i think that's probably the hardest part is how do you then get it and go well take my moon call off that spot so i take this action yeah well and i mean now ryan has talked in in the past about having helper players 
Yes. Uh, and that may be the solution is you, you can't do it on your own. You still can't do it on your own, but you might not have been able to do it on your own in person either. Um, if you, I don't know, if, if, if the, the helper is, is, is able to, to work with you, um, which again limits you because you're not as, um, able to work, to be on your own as I'm sure everyone wants to be. Right. Uh, but you know, because of the nature of some games, you know, we've, we've talked in about games that are and aren't, uh, compatible with, with making readily available for, uh, Ryan to play and, and some of the work mm -hmm. that he has to go through to change games up, to make sure that they are as, um, available for him as they, they could be. Uh, and that's with the normal, you know, board games in person, uh, that same sort of level has to be looked at when it comes to the online uh, and as to what can and can't be done and what needs mm -hmm. to be done and what, uh, what game, what paths games can take to be more accessible with or without the assistance and the steps yeah. taken. I said, one of the things Ryan's noting is that yes, he could play with assistance, but when asking for that assistance, he's getting silence, which is unfortunate. Yeah. So apparently there's a, there's an online dominion implementation that's accessible and slay the spire uh, and some uh, fan made magic, the gathering apps. Available. That one makes sense. Cause it's all the cards, right? Right. You, you'd be able to get the cards. It's just, it's kind of disappointing. That's not out there. Obviously there's not enough demand for people to have created it. And I think part of that is the, the people haven't known to ask for it. Well, and part right. of the problem is I think, you know, a lot of the, accessibility we've seen growing in demand and the, 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 the growth of the industry of accessibility was forced by uh, the Americans with Disability Act uh, and similar, similar legislation in various countries. Uh, but that sort of legislation doesn't exist online. And, yeah. and that's where we probably, you know, and, and I'm not someone who is heavy on supporting legislation, especially not in the online space, but, it may be something where we need a push um, and it will probably unfortunately come from Europe because that seems to be where they're actually willing to legislate online uh, things. But, you know, if, if it's going to take that sort of a push like the uh, ADA Act in the States did to make sure that these people are being heard, that may be, that may be what it takes. And, and you may have, you know, I'm websites proudly announcing that they are accessible. Yeah. I would love to see it, to be honest. But yeah, I think it needs it needs a push from somewhere. Yeah. Maybe it maybe it's a Kickstarter that someone can start on. Like uh, I there are definitely like Ryan's mentioned before, I'm blanking out podcasts that talk about these topics. Oh, absolutely, like, absolutely. They just need to organize, I think, and like get a hold of Board Game Arena and say, Hey, can do something for us. I don't know what, but something. And if you get enough names on that petition, people might pay attention and take notice. Absolutely. Uh, and I think, and definitely, I think Board Game Arena would be the right target. I yeah, mean, like they, that's they, the one I they think. Have like, the, they have the market share right now, yeah. uh, by, by and large. Um, I, I don't know what their numbers are right now, but I know they're Who still knows? ridiculously high. Yes. <laughs> I'm talking about things changing once the pandemic hit and shifting to online. Man, that's, they did a good job on that site keeping up with growing uh, usage in the early days of the pandemic. That's interesting. Oh, right now, there's only actually 6,000 people online playing board That's games. That's actually way lower than it it's, was. It's but much lower Most people lower are back now. to work now because, yeah. you know... School and school and work are a thing again. School and work uh, are a thing in again. In whatever format. It is, is definitely a thing. Yeah. All right, I think we'll do one more from Jeff and then we will move on. All right. So, why do you think that more people seem to have I seem to find success making content about games than find success making games, publishing games, or even, you know, running a game store. Uh, are there more people finding success making content about games? That's the only part I don't know. I don't know if, if the basis for the, the question is actually true. Um, we are successful content creators, but most people who are, I think the big thing uh, is that most of the people making content aren't i'm not saying they're failing are not successful at making content they're successful and in their spare time make content like they're they're people who have full-time jobs there there are very very few people in both the tabletop or well, the tabletop industry and both rpgs or board games that do it full-time it is extremely rare and i think that it's a lot easier if you're working a full-time job have kids family and lots of obligations 
to produce the occasional blog post, right? Or to get together with your friend and record a podcast. We do a heck of a lot more work than most podcasters casters do because we try to put out our content on three fronts. We want audio, video, and, and text. We want people to be able to listen, watch, or read. Not everyone does that. Actually, I don't know anyone else that does that for that matter. And I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying it's different because we have the time. This is my full-time job. I have the time to do that. And Sean works from home, so he has the time to do the editing. So he doesn't have the, the commute or anything else to get in there. And he has the, the, the free time in the office to do it in. So I think why you see more content creators out there creating content is because they're passionate about the thing. Whatever that thing happens to be, whether our board games or whatever, snorkeling, they're they're out there creating blog posts or recording podcasts. And, and part of that too is accessibility. It is really simple to record a podcast now. Like um, there's Podbean or there's a couple other ones where you just get the app on your phone and you literally hit record and talk and you're done. And then it publishes it for you and even puts ads in and you can make money on it. Uh, Anchor is another company that does that. There are, if you are into the OSR RPG, if you're into the old school AD&D first edition style, Anchor became the haven for that type of player in that group. There are hundreds of OSR podcasts on there because everyone has a, had a phone and they could figure out how to hit record and put it out on there. So I think that's the big thing is, is, is content. I don't want to say content creation is easy, but when compared to making a game or publishing a game now running game stores is something completely different. I think the only reason it's easier to make content than run a game store is I think game stores are almost impossible to be profitable in today's day and age. You can't just be a store that sells games. Try try and be a bookstore, for instance. You know, it's, yeah, it's, like <laughs> just trying to be a bookstore, right? You have to have something special there to draw people in. And with the pandemic going on, like I'm amazed that our local stores are still open. Like, like, because there's no reason to go there now. Like, like, I don't know, some of them are still running events and trying to be safe and social distance and masks, whatever. I personally too high risk to, to even consider tra- checking it out myself, but they're, they're struggling. Right. So I don't know. I, I, I think that's what it is, is that, that most content about games is hobby content. It, it's successful people using their spare time to talk about and create things for things they're passionate about. They're passion projects. They're not businesses, right? They're not, the the, the the other thing like there is no success to be had like except for pride right like they're they're doing it as because they love doing it so they're not worrying about making it for that matter it's it's a, a lot of it is sort of again what you decide decide define as success uh, and, and and what you're what you're looking for and what you're what you're trying to achieve so you can make a board game and it will probably take you say three years uh just I'm throwing, throwing some random numbers out here. So three years to work through from a great idea and play testing it and marketing it and getting the Kickstarter out there and working through, and then you finally see a profit. Maybe, <laughs> if you're lucky. Maybe. Um, so having that game out there, and then you've got to do another game. And so that's another three years. And maybe that overlaps, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe you're going to go have a three-year gap in there. Um, and so the, the time investment to get a, a something out there like a, a game is is huge. Uh, even even writing an RPG manual, I mean, that's not you know you're looking the work of of co- the concepts and the the writing and then the ed- the editing process and layouts and all that stuff takes forever. Whereas we can sit down and in four hours put out a RPG or a, a, sorry a Gloomhaven FAQ <laughs> that's based off of someone else's content. And with our own, you know, based off of someone else's content, with our own twist and our own discussion and dialogue over our that. Our own bitter banter. Our own bitter banter. There we go. <laughs> and, and turn that into something. And for us, that was successful. But yeah. what that means as, for successful is not a financial thing. I mean, that no. did nothing and probably never will do anything financially for us. Uh, the, 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 two years we've spent on this podcast have been successful in many ways, uh, but not really financially. Um, mm-hmm. They've gotten us to, to meet and know great people and great connections, uh, gotten an opportunity to play games we may never have gotten our hands mm-hmm. on otherwise. Uh, and that's a personal success that, that we were looking for and we wanted and we got. Uh, but it has been two years of slogging to barely make the bare minimum YouTube level, for instance, of, yeah. of, you know, making a few cents 
on a video view. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so far, our Gloomhaven FAQ, our most popular YouTube video of all time that has thousands of views, has made us a dollar seventy two. Yeah. That's... So, again, it's it's how you look at success. I think that Gloomhaven view, uh, FAQ is hugely successful, but in a financial sense, it ain't. No. Um, or compared to videos about how to make a cake. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know? yeah, I mean right? you've got, like... you know, and again, we are a very niche uh topic right yep. the, the the best board game people out there aren't massive when you compare them no. to and again I, I i me and my kids do minecraft a lot so minecraft is my first thing you know some of the top minecraft players have millions and millions mm -hmm. of subscribers uh yeah. and you know they drop a video and in the first 10 minutes they've got two hundred thousand views yeah uh we Which will never see more that. than a dollar <laughs> We will, we will never see that, but that's okay because we're not in a, a market that can support 1.5 million mm. <laughs> subscribers. Yeah. And we, I, I talk about, right. I do this full time, but it's not the podcast. It's everything of mine. It's not the podcast. It's not the, the, the blog. It's not like it's all of it combined. And still the majority of the money becomes because I share deals on games on Twitter, which has nothing to do with the podcast or anything else, except they happen to be games like that. That's it. The only thing keeping us afloat, which is sad because pretty much all our eggs are in one basket, right? Like we got a couple of in there, but they're like, you know, quail eggs versus you know <laughs> the the big goose egg that that is amazon right now um so that's why we appreciate like people like our patrons and stuff like that like you look at how much we make on patreon and how much we get from twitch and how much and like you add that up and i'm like that would probably be able to support my hobby of buying games and playing them myself and that's what it did for years it's just that now we're doing a bit more so i i don't know the the thing a lot of people don't realize and i have no idea if jeff knows this or not is that people don't have success making games. Stefan Feld is, we talk about all the time, has a day job. Like this is a person who releases one to five games a year, is considered one of the best game designers on the planet. His games are instant hits when they sell. People buy them based on his name, is still a principal at a school. And not, I, I don't know if it's by choice or not, but like the fact, or if you get into role playing, you start talking about, like Wizards of the Coast, I don't know if this number is still true, but the last time I checked employs eight people. RPG books are written by a heck of a lot more than eight people. Wizards yeah. of the Coast, Hasbro, funded role-playing division, is only able to employ eight people. That's it. And there are stuff like PR managers and stuff. They're not necessarily game designers. I don't even know if Wizards of the Coast currently has a game designer on, on role. It's just they're not... Game designing is not really a, a full-time job it is not something you get success at game publishers tend to be have jobs and then finally make it so an example is stronghold games i think it was two years ago now was finally stephen bonacore of stronghold he's now retired actually he's done well enough but was able to quit his full-time job which was being a stock trader on the new york stock exchange where he literally went downtown new york to run stronghold games full-time and that took him 12 years, I think, before he was able to get to the point he was able to do that. And then eventually he was able to merge with another company and things went great. But like I, the, the amount of success in this industry is very small when you think of it as, are you able to support a life from that hobby? It, it is minuscule, the number of people who manage to pull it off. I mean, you look at, let's, let's, let's look at Critical Role, right? Critical Role is a massive success and no one is denying that. But it was almost the end of their first season before they were make able to make minimum wage. Yeah. Uh, now they're doing well now. I mean, no, yep, I, they're, and they're, I don't know what they're, it's... and I don't know what their numbers are. I, but uh, all the research I'm able to do shows that, you know, in that first season, again, it took them a, a, a season to make minimum wage. Um, and so and a all lot of those of people, people at, at the time had other jobs. Yeah. Like they, they also did critical role. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's one of those things where, again, even, even getting the big numbers doesn't necessarily mean success in a financial way, even yeah. if as I, you know, within our hobby, it's a massive success. Yeah. And then like I said, game stores, I'm shocked anyone can pull it off. Like to yeah, be honest, I, I don't know. Like, yeah. like collectible card games is the only thing keeping them going. And even without that, I don't know. 
Yeah. Like our local game store has started to branch out into Gunpla, which is cool because there's a bunch of locals that support it. So that the, your secret as a game store is find out what the local gamers want and provide it, right? Yeah. Whether that's a game space or it's cheap prices, like if you have to make 1% on all your games and sell enough games to make money, like that might be your secret I mean, is to, to be able to offer the cheap prices. But more likely, you need to find that thing that you can't do. You offer painting classes so that people buy your paints and models or you have a place to play or whatever. Like I said, with the pandemic, I, I'm amazed that our yeah. local stores are still here. I really am. Like, like thumbs up for everyone who's still supporting them. That's awesome. Absolutely. I love I you, don't FLGS. know how they're making it. I mean, I, you know, I, I, and I have to say, I, you know, I supported my FLGS, my, my game, the game, you know, Spectaculars, which still hasn't gotten unboxed yet. Yeah. Um, I, I had the chance to order it online, but I would have had to wait. And the option was there to order it through my local FLGS. So I did. I called yeah. them up and I probably paid a little more than I would have uh, ordering it straight through the website. But I was happy to support them. Uh, and I went there and it was great. You know, they had they had masks available at the door. They had uh, um, sanitizer right there at the door. And I walked in and they stayed away from me and I stayed away from them. Yeah. Put the game on the counter and was on my way. But... And now that's it for this month's AMA. Thank you to everyone who joined us live tonight and presented us with questions, as well as those who couldn't be here, but took time to send in questions ahead of time. Uh, finally, if you've got a game or game night question for us, you can head over to the website, click on ask the bellhop, or just send us an email questions at tabletopbellhop.com. 